most people, when they talk about mediumship, think about mental mediumship. The thing with mental mediumship is that only the medium hears what's going on from spirit and they have to translate it. They have to take symbols, they have to take signs and make meaning out of it. And all of the mediums say that it's not, it's an inexact process, you know, that they can make mistakes. And I think even the best mental mediums are about 85% accurate. Then we have trance mediumship. Deep trance mediumship is still a form of mental mediumship. And, and again, most trance uh, speakers are only are bringing through their, their guide or, or their, their control. They're not bringing through directly uh, individuals in the afterlife. There are, are some exceptions and sometimes they are able to bring through uh, direct communication with people. But what we're going to be talking about today is physical mediumship. Now, physical mediumship, if it's, it, it is when a spirit contact can be seen, heard, or touched by all the people present, not just the medium. So you've got sort of like on a, sen, an, on a, a sliding scale, you've got some physical mediumship is just wraps and taps, objects being moved, levitation. Then we get to matter through matter, uh, things actually uh, being changed physically, apports and asports, spirit lights, cold breezes, touches by spirit hands, precipitation of paintings, um, voices separate from the medium, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, materialization, and, and uh, sometimes you will even have healing. Healing is can be a part of physical mediumship. Inga, have I left anything out? No, I think you're doing uh, a much... great job. You keep going, I keep coughing. We are... <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, that's great. Um, so physical mediumship has a long history. As far as we know, there has been physical mediumship in all indigenous cultures. The Aboriginal culture of Australia is rich with physical mediumship. So is the American Indian culture, ancient China. Um, there's a very interesting book called Moses and Jesus, the Shamans, which claims that physical mediumship is the foundation of all religions. You know, in, in those days when they heard a voice coming from midair, they thought it was God, uh, not necessarily their dead grandmother. And, uh, and you had words like prophets and uh, rather than being called psychics or mediums. And of course, physical mediumship is the basis of spiritualism, which is fascinating considering a huge number of spiritualists are actually hostile to physical mediumship. Now, one of the things about physical mediumship and particularly direct voice is that it's based on a substance called ectoplasm which is taken from the pancreas of the medium sometimes this is the process of the ectoplasm being taken is uncomfortable for the medium so the medium prefers to be in deep trance it can pour out of the skin the palms of the hands the stomach the eyes the ears the nose sometimes it comes up through the throat and out of the mouth most physical mediums work in total darkness, so you can't see the spirits that materialize. Uh, some, as uh, we'll be talking about, are able to, to take a little bit of red light or blue light, but ectoplasm is very sensitive to light and being touched at the wrong time can harm the medium. It springs back into the medium's body and can injure or kill them. Most physical mediums have been burned by the ectoplasm at some time. Helen Duncan, famously a famous physical medium in England, died as a result of a police raid. The police came bursting into a seance after they were be told it was fraudulent, turned on the lights, the ectoplasm went straight back into her body and she hemorrhaged and she died four weeks later. Alec Harris, one of the best physical mediums of all time, 
was seriously injured when a, uh, a materialized spirit was was grabbed by a sitter. So as you can see, it is quite dangerous and precautions have to be taken when people sit in physical mediumship. The, I found this fantastic reference here, which I'll put up uh, in the chat window later, which if you're interested in ectoplasm and phys physical mediums and everything, everything related to that, you can follow that one up. When we're coming to direct voice, and this is the difference between direct voice and trance, a lot of Americans, I find, say, oh, yes, I do physical mediumship. I go into trance and a voice speaks through me. Well, that is not direct voice. In direct voice, there is usually a voice box materialized. You can see this one with Leslie Flint. It's different from trance mediumship. You can have trance mediumship in the light and different levels of trance. But fit, uh, with direct voice mediumship, there is a materialized voice box. Here we've got materialized voice box with Jack Weber. And you can see he's got ectoplasm coming out of the other ear. And here we've got um, Mina Crandon, Marjorie. Uh, also, you see that same structure. These are very rare photographs because they have to get permission from the spirit team. They have to have red light and they do it just a series of uh, photos opening the aperture without using a flash because the flash can really harm the medium. Um, so that's, that's uh, the difference between direct voice mediumship and uh, trans mediumship. Sometimes the voice box, which is down here, is amplified by a trumpet. And you'll come into the, in your, you'll see in the literature, there's, they, what, there's what they call trumpet mediumship. You can see there is ectoplasm going from the medium to the trumpet. And the ectoplasm is kind of like these, love, these really fine, thin threads of ectoplasm joining the trumpet. And that allows the trumpet to be uh, moved around with the sitters and the trumpet will come to you individually and you can, the, so they, they can, it can make the voices seem louder. Uh, it's, a, it's like a megaphone. It also allows for private messages. So they've been, uh, in the old days, you'd have the trumpet mediums, uh, trumpet going around and giving a message just to one person in the circle. But the trumpet is controlled by ectoplasm. It's not just floating in the air. There's a very famous photo of a famous medium named Jack Weber in England in the 1930s, I think it was. Jean, you would know this, wouldn't you? Uh, Jack Weber, not sure. And you can see here, there's two trumpets. You've got ectoplasm coming out of his mouth, controlling this trumpet, and you've got ectoplasm coming out of his belly button controlling the other one and so you sometimes have more than one trumpet going around the room you'll notice that he's tied into the chair now this is with uh, uh, physical mediums if they're doing a demonstration this is for their own protection inga could i get you to talk about this you you and i talked about this why do we tie the mediums into the chair in a phys in a public demonstration well, we were told by the spirit communicators that, um, you know, most people think it is to show that the medium is honest, but actually they're not really concerned about it because they say if we want to take someone out of binds, we just do it. We don't, you know, we don't need your permission. But when um, the mind is inspired, Normally, the, the body seems to try to follow that direction as well. And the problem is when they spasm, when they create an ectoplasm, often the body spasms. And so it itself, the medium itself, could hit the ectoplasm and have the same result with burns as when a sitter would touch the ectoplasm. So it is actually for the medium's protection. It is to the, protect the medium, not harm himself. 
obviously unintentionally, but yes. I interesting. Um, Cyan and Paul, do you have any input on that one? G'day, Wendy, how's it going? Hi, Paul. We're just making cups of tea. Oh, um, okay. It's interesting, up, up in um, Townsville, where the, you know, sort of Indigenous mediums here, they actually don't tie themselves in at all, and they get up and they, they in trance, they walk around and talk. And that is considered normal behaviour for a medium. So it seems to be that it's only in the Western society, so it could be wrong, don't mind if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. that mediums need to be tied in for some reason. Yeah. But I mean, it, is it always ectoplasm or do they just use photoplasm? It, no, well, this is the thing. It's about like nobody can actually say, look, that's specifically ectoplasm. That's this. It could be a blend of this, this, and that. Yeah. Um, you know, this is the whole thing about spirit stuff, isn't it? It's, it can be blending and it can be a whole range of things. And I think this is the difference between Western mediumship and other types of mediumship. They don't try to name it. They just accept it. Yeah, they would. They wouldn't even understand what those words were: ectoplasm, no. photoplasm, any type. And of And they plasm. wouldn't care either. That's it's just meaningless. My feeling is that the indigenous mediumship is quite different. It's kind of like a, a more natural force, yeah. uh, and I don't know that they um, they have voice boxes. I think it, it seems to be more just in the air. You know. Um, yeah. Without, I've, without, sat, I've sat with some of the mediums. Have you? It's been really good. Yeah, and we saw like spirits uh, come out of the didgeridoos. Right. Yeah. Uh, and did they, were they able to do this in light? Yeah, daylight. In daylight. Yeah, because yeah. when, when you go back into the history, you, you find there are cases of, of um, materializations in full daylight and mm -hmm. uh, some of the, me the, the mediums. And they can't be using ectoplasm. I think the whole point is it, it's just, Different, there are differences. There are all kinds of uh, ways that this that spirit can work. Uh, you know what I think? I think that a lot of indigenous, we you know, just talking about that, that they're family. They're sitting with each other. They they want their loved ones to come through. Whereas with the Western mediumship, you could have people you've never sat with, you don't know, and so you know people. Well, we need to tie the medium into the chair, or you know whatever. And so there's completely. It's a mindset the problem if you're sitting with everybody that you know and you know they all love you they're waiting for their loved ones to come through it's all about ancestors right? ancestry yeah yeah exactly it, it, it's it's yeah, really but it's ectoplasm i still think it is a problem i think they the same as yeah with western mediums now they want a lot of mediums i know they don't even want to sit if they're not tied in because it is their belief they will say, I'm a fraud if I'm not tied yeah, in. That, that's know, right. Think, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's then right. And with the, with that's the that side, isn't it? That's mm -hmm. that side. You see what I mean? Whereas yeah. if you were sitting in Indigenous, you'd be sitting with all your family. Yeah. There's no, there's no reason to distrust. There's no reason to prove. It's a natural um, process that's probably gone on for that, for that family for, till, since time began. You know, it's just a natural thing whereas over here now it's a very when i was over here in westernized um circles will say it's very rigid very structured you know you've got to do a b c and d to get to z 20 years later or whatever you know it's like you've got to tick all the boxes with them they're just doing what they always did and they're, Gloria, not what, about it. they're just uh, doing it thanks thanks uh, sir gloria if ectoplasm comes from the medium's pancreas, which that's real curious, uh, does it deplete the medium's pancreas? Yes. That's uh, what, one, of, one of the reasons is that one of the side effects is many physical mediums become diabetic. It's one of the dangers of the job. Uh, I know with David, our medium, um, he's had massive sugar fluctuations and uh, after, after a seance, they will uh, want sugar. We'd always mm -hmm. have, we'd always keep chocolates for David after a seance to sort of deplete, you know, to think. And, and yes, the whole thing can be, can be um, bad for the health. Len? Well, I'm trying to struggle with the physiological process. Obviously you have ectoplasm production. There's a, a, a tremendous expenditure of energy. Now, is yes. there a blending of energies, say, of the medium's etheric body along with the spirit energy? Is there, uh, does the energy of the sitters 
have an influence all on of the this above whole process absolutely the thought, everything is energy and, yep. and you know it's all it's, the different forms manifestations of energy and i'm trying to get struggle with this this cellular or material ectoplasm is being produced this is a tremendous amount of energy affecting the physiological nature of the pancreas the metabolism and the sitters energies too you know oh. this is a complex process here absolutely of all, of all absolutely the, one of the, the things relationship of energies well read that 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 uh, reference i gave you uh, it's about you you will love it because it's so complex and one of the things um that we've that inger can talk about too is that they've found that when the spirit is materialized the medium's body can go down by 30 percent their body weight so wow. it has a massive effect on the body inga what is... were your experiences on this with gary i just have my dogs are going mad but that's okay um yes uh, so there was a measurement done and so the weight goes significantly down of the medium when they use ectoplasm. And so from the danger, I've, I heard a story the other day, even the medium is a healer, and he, but he works with energy. So he does not, uh, he didn't really prescribe to ectoplasm. So he, was told or he told people if you stop me healing i will burn inside because i have built so much of this energy i will burn right. and so the other day by accident i heard uh, when he was operated on he had stomach cancer and the doctors were saying at the end he passed that they cannot understand when they opened him that it looked like his whole inside was burned severely. How you know, so Bruno Gröning, so he was healing like thousands of people at once in Germany. And then the government and the doctors decided they forbid him to heal because obviously money and da da da. And so he would warn people and say, I will die and burn from the inside if I cannot use that energy continuously. And he did in a very short time. So is there that, is so much more what a mediumship does to the body. So much more we, you know, we need to be aware of, I think, when you work with it and not overwork with it. Absolutely. David, David Wright. Yes, uh, Gary Mannion came to, to the United States two, two months ago, and he came to Buffalo, and I went to a, science, a seance with him, and uh, he was to, it, was, it was eight hours, and he was just totally exhausted by the time he was done, because uh, we met after, the group of 12 of us met after, totally exhausted, and then um, he showed us his legs, and he had burn marks on his legs. Okay. So what you're saying is true. They, it is an exhausting thing for them. This medium here in the picture, um, Jack Weber, he was exhausting himself. I think it was during the Second World War, and I, I know he was doing seances every night. And he died, I think, in, in his early 40s. Anybody know exactly? I know, I know he died very, very young. And it was considered that he, his excess mediumship had something to do with it. Some mediums I know um, will only sort of sit for physical mediumship once or twice a year. It's so bad on the body. It's, it's sort of, it, uh, it can be quite dangerous. Okay, moving on, just to give you some idea of some of the physical mediums in America. We all know Leslie Flint, but I put together at this site called America's Almost Forgotten Mediums. Um, you've got this one, Jonathan Coons in the 1850s. And uh, a it's a fascinating research. Emily French, this is Riley Hegarty's, uh, gave us a talk on the mediumship of e Emily French. Elizabeth Blake was doing direct voice in light. And uh, uh, Riley's written about her a book called The Direct Voice, which is absolutely fascinating. Joseph B. Johnson, Etta Reet was an amazing medium. She was fantastic. George Valentine, a famous medium who was famous for bringing through um, 
uh, Confucius with knowledge that nobody understood. He brought through a lot of people speaking foreign languages that he couldn't possibly know. Uh, Mina Crandon, she was the one who was attacked by Houdini and uh, everybody still thinks Mina was a fraud, but she was one of the most brilliant mediums that ever lived. Clifford Bias, Sophia Williams, um, Frank Decker. Frank Decker is absolutely fascinating. He was actually doing physical mediumship on the radio, on mainstream radio. And uh, they, they had the speaker up near the, the ceiling and the various uh, materialized entities would go up to the speaker where um, they, they could be heard. Ethel Post Parish, Reverend Dorothy Flexer, uh, Reverend Florence Becker, William Carutha. A lot of these people, there's very little written ab about them. Um, and this is why I call it America's almost forgotten mediums. And yet in their heyday, they convinced thousands and thousands of people about the afterlife. Okay, David Thompson, um, born in England. He became a mental medium from about age 17. He's been a physical medium for about 30 years. He lived in Sydney, Australia for about 10 years, but he's now based in New Zealand. Um, Victor and I sat with David in his home circle from about 2005 to about 2014. And altogether, we worked out that we'd experienced more than 400 seances and more than 100 reunions. Now, for me, the most evidential thing in, in, in mediumship is when you have a reunion between somebody in spirit and their loved ones on earth, and you can hear them talking to each other. Now, um, Craig has done a wonderful uh, presentation about the Annie Manji tapes and some of the other um, reunions. Craig, would you like to come in on this? How important do you see the reunions as uh, evidence of the afterlife? Yeah, I agree. And the, the reason is that we both have the effect upon the individual who's having the reunion, but we also have that testimony when other people see that a person has said, I've had a, a reunion with somebody, who now understands what where they are and why they're there. They recount things about the person's daily life, the person who's still on earth, about their daily life now, meaning that they're very much alive. And then they have words for them that are private words that no one else would know. So it's tremendously evidential for the survival of consciousness. And the other thing about reunions is that they're very healing for the spirit as well often and, and louis uh, louis sergio would um would talk about this i know in his seances part of the reason is to heal not only the grieving person here but to heal the person on the other side to to yes. uh, un, undo damage louis would you like to speak about that yes here in our uh, spirit release meetings right many times we are requested by the spirit team to get prepared for some kind of ectoplasmic seance because some spirits will have their bodies re reconstructed with uh, the, the fluids that will be extracted from the mediums, you know. And this is very common, which happens that uh, many times these spirits are loved ones that are attached to families here on earth. And because of this, these people of the family are sick because they are receiving their direct influence of the loved ones from the other side. And by healing those people, you heal the people here. And there's lots of evidence of that. It's a great work. And I think, Inga, this is what Gary Mannion is doing too, isn't it? They're talking, you're talking about healing seances, of healing the relationship between the person over there and here. And um, so, so that they can both be healed. Yes. Is that that's that have you experienced that in some of the reunions well um yes i found one was very with a friend of mine whose mom passed a little while ago and her and her mom were a little bit at odds most of their life and um 
So there was another lady who had exactly the same history. So um, Abraham asked both, both ladies to sit in the middle and he was then explaining to the sitters to just leave all their busy minds behind and just focus on these two ladies and be willing to uh, to give energy to that process and nothing else. And so um, then the, he brought in a way forward information from both mothers. The both ladies said they could feel their mothers there. And um, he was then explaining, you know, use physical mediumship or mediumship as such, it's only brought to your world for healing, nothing else. It's not for entertainment. It's not to say, oh, yes, yeah, an afterlife. He goes, everything you learn about the afterlife is healing for everyone to know you, your loved ones will always be there to know, you know, you live on and all this. So these two ladies had the most healing experience. The whole room of 25 was crying <laughs> in the end of it. And it was just so beautiful. It was just so successful. It was just amazing. Right. Amazing. Well, I'm, I'm going to play you a tape. I think some of you might have heard it because Craig uses it. Um, I was actually, actually there at this reunion with uh, Nick and Sarah. It's an I've been more than a hundred of these reunions, but I think you can understand a lot of people will not share the tape because it's so precious that they mm. cannot stand the thought of skeptics saying, oh, it's rubbish. It's mm. just like a violation. But Sarah, uh, I spoke to afterwards and she, gave, she wrote me a lovely letter saying why she was willing to share the tape. And um, so I think that was just such a beautiful thing on her part that she could share such a sacred moment when her they were they were boyfriend and girlfriend from the age of 15 and he was killed in a motorcycle accident and this this was only about a month after he died he came through and he was able to talk to her and reassure her that he knew that she had what she'd put in the coffin she knew um, everything that she had done Listen to this. Listen to me. Listen to me. I've got no. Listen to me. Okay, my baby. Always remember. Yeah. I love you from my heart. Okay. I told you that just before I left you. I know. I'll always be with you. Always be with you. Okay, my darling. Promise me something. Yes. I want you to be happy. I will for you. I will for you. I'll make the best of what I've got here. For you. Remember, whatever happens, we'll always be together all we need to gain. You promise me that? I promise you. I, you, you. Yeah. I promise you. Okay, my darling. I want you to be happy. I will try. I am trying. I'm trying so hard. It's just such a shock, you know? But I'm trying hard. I'm, I'm doing better. I'm doing better, darling. Your girl, your girl, you're doing my best. As long as I've got you with me and I know I do, I just hope I've done enough for you. Yes, you did use me if I ever wanted. I was. I'm good. I just wanted to be enough. That's why I died peacefully. You, oh, thank goodness. That's why I had to look at peace on my face. Yes. Did you see me when I went to see you? I did. I did. Do right by you. I tried to do everything I could. I really you tried hard. You don't bother me, man. You do the one. Bother me, man. You do the one. Okay, my baby, because you know you were worth it. You don't ever doubt how much I loved you and how much I will continue to love you. Don't ever doubt. Don't really mind up for you. As you can see, it's a very emotional time in the seance room. 
and everybody is affected. The, the energy in the room when these things happen is incredible. Okay, this is another one, another reunion, but it's Gordon Higginson, the famous uh, English medium. And what was evidential is it shows that he's come to talk to a friend of his, Ken Pretty, in New Zealand, and um, it shows his memory. He he's rem he remembers um, everything everything about their last reunion. God bless you. My name is Gordon Higginson. Oh, Hello, Gordon. Oh, Gordon. It's Ken Pretty here. Yes, I do. That's why I'm here. You know. <laughs> You're very clear. Well, I hope so. Yes, I you said the words when I was upon the earth. Absolutely. I did, didn't I? Yes, you did. Yes. I've given your faith that I can't handle I see you. Wonderful. I play it. Mm -hmm. I've never heard of you. I've worked at your church in London Road. I've been stuck to one chair. So good chair. There you are. It's a long time ago. Way back in the early 60s, I think. Do not work at uh, Castleford. Oh, Castleford, yes, that's right. Yes, I beg your pardon. I say the weekend, you do. Come on, don't forget. Thank you. you. <laughs> 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 My fault, I do apologize. I do apologize. You're trying to catch me out, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't do it. <laughs> Gordon was always a stickler for accuracy. This is a fascinating fellow, Quentin Crisp. Some of you might know Quentin. Um, Inga's got some stories about Quentin, but he, he would come through and he was absolutely outrageous. Did you know one of the reasons that I come fools to prove to you all that even homosexuals live beyond death? Yes. <laughs> and for Victor, yeah. that proves that the Catholics are speaking out of where the sun doesn't shine. Yeah. <laughs> Not that in your report. I sure will. <laughs> Tell them the Quentin came through. I will. Absolutely. And say yeah. that even homosexuals live beyond death. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Quentin is a scream. Inga, would you like to tell us some Quentin stories? <laughs> Oh, very I funny. Him. I love him. <laughs> Many people didn't because he's very coarse and very cheeky, but I thought it was hilarious. My first seance when I had no idea, I was, and it wasn't even told it was in the dark, so it was a bit of a thing. And Quentin turned up and I had never heard his name or anything. I just thought he was so hilarious. So he came next to me. Nobody had talked to me about materializations or what is possible. And he sat on a lady's lap next to me. And then he sat on my fingers. So I could feel um, like a bony structure and it was cold, a little bit sticky. Um, and in my head, I was thinking, if this is real, this gentleman is tall and skinny because from a nursing point of view, I'm saying this is the bottom of an older person, but it, is, it seems very tall. And so um, he was saying to me, um, oh, I'm doing something to your friend, which a gentleman I met there who was German. And so I hear the other person going, oh, my God, no. Oh my God. So I'm asking in German, hey, what's happening over there? He goes, I can't say because he was very straight. The person was very straight and proper. And so Quentin keep going, tell her, tell her what I'm doing. So he told me in German that Quentin was sitting on his lap and rubbing his legs. And this gentleman was petrified. And we all were just laughing so hard. But Quentin said, you need to understand. I am. I am alive. I am a person. And I can turn up in your world. So that was my first impression with Quentin Quiz. But he was just awesome. <laughs> he was hilarious. Now, one of the reasons that Louis Armstrong came through is 
that his, his voice is so distinctive. Um, and uh, David said that they bring Louis through for the people who've never had a personal loved one come through. And um, his, uh, he comes through and, and he usually sings, but in this case, he was actually talking with Victor. A lot of energy went tonight, so... Yeah. <laughs> my friend! <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to hearing you hearing next week, huh? <laughs> my friend! Long and I'm dear! <laughs> you promise? It's time! Right. Mr. Zahn! Yeah, I am. I'd like you to do, you to do something for me. Uh, yes. I've got a talk as I am now, and you feel free to match my bars. <laughs> I shall <sure> try. <laughs> God bless you all. Yeah. We'd been talking about uh, matching the voices with the voice of the spirit materialized with the, uh, with the voices before they died. These tapes, now I've, you can listen to these tapes in full on a website, victorzamet.com forward slash Montague. I think these are some of the best evidence for the afterlife ever. Um, Montague Keane, as some of you know, was the lead researcher on the Skull Report. And he was, um, he was very, very angry about the response of the skeptics to the Skull Report. I think we put in the report this week an article he wrote two years after the end of the end of the skull report and he was saying you know we proved everything they couldn't disprove anything and yet they're just ignoring it they're pretending it didn't happen and he said we're still working on it and he sat with david thompson two months before he died and he wrote a fantastic report about david and that's on this website, victorzamet.com forward slash Montague. But he came through three weeks. This is the first time he came through, three weeks after he died. This man hasn't been over long, oh, right. but he asked if he could come through and speak. Oh, good. Right. Of course he can. Of course he can. Yeah. Hello. 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 Yes, yes, we can. We can hear you. Yes, we can. Go on. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, yes we can. Yes. This is Montague Keane. Hello, Montague. Oh, Montague. Great. Good evening. Good evening. I wondered if you'd be so kind to pass a message to my wife, Veronica. Yes, certainly. Yes. Could you please tell her that I'm well? Yes. And that I'm with her most of the time. Yes. And, my dear. Yes. I do apologise about the, oh, the, 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 the misunderstanding regarding the scratch. Don't worry about it, it's all forgotten. Well, I did worry about it, you know. I didn't want people to get the wrong idea. No, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, that's, everything's fine, don't worry about it. I understand that you're taping it, is that Yes, right? I am, yes, yes, yes. Well, I have something to say. Where's, where's the microphone? Above you, it's near the light. Is it now? Yeah, yeah, yeah you'll, you'll, the they'll pick you up, no problem. Veronica, if you can hear me, my dear, I love you very much. And I'm all right, and I'm going to carry on the work from my side now, from the spirit side. And I just wanted to tell you that it's everything that I thought it would be, and so much more, so much more it is. And I've met my dear mother, and don't worry about me, Veronica. I'll be all right. Yes, yes, I'll be all right. I, I love you. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you, you Monica. That was great. Thank, thank you for giving time. me the opportunity to, 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 to come through. Yeah. Yes. And mm. I believe that one of the reasons why I attended this young man's seance was that I could feel the vibration mm -hmm. so I, I, I could find it what, much more easily to come through. It yes. did really yes. well. Yes. Indeed, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes. And just for the record, just for the record, 
the school seances were exactly as they were. There was no fraudulence of any sort at right. all. Of course there wasn't. Right. No fraudulence. Wonderful, yes. I just thought I'd tell you that. That's wonderful. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very, very much indeed. Good night. 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 Before I go, yes. would you please uh, write a report about this sound? Yes. Because I'd like everybody to know that I came through. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Isn't he gorgeous? Yeah. He's just so polite and so English. Now this was, he, you can notice he, he, he'd only, only been over uh, for a couple of months and uh, no, sorry, he, that was three weeks after he died that he came through. Three weeks. A couple of months later, on the 16th of May, he's much more confident. Hello. 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 Yes, yes, we can. Can I speak in clearly? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. oh. Excellent. Uh, you know who it is, don't you? It's Monty. Of course it's Monty. <laughs> Are you here, Guy? Yes, I'm over here. Oh, good, good. I'm so glad that you were able to be here. Well, me too. Yes, yes. yes. And is that you, son? Yes, it is. Oh, they managed to get to you up here. Yes, they did, oh. yes. Fantastic. It's wonderful to hear you, Morrissey. Now, does, does my voice sound clear? It does. It's yes, very it's good. very good, yes. It mastered oh. it very well. Well, it, it's taken me a little bit of time. That's right, Monty. It's going to be a little bit of time to, to, to get it just right. Yes. Yeah. Now, that's quite a long speech. I mean, this is incredible. He's talking to, to Robin Foy and Sandra Foy and Guy Lyon Playfair, and they're chatting about old times and they're making jokes. They're talking about the, the skeptics from the Society for Psychical Research. They're making jokes about uh, the, the uh, Enfield poltergeist. Um, and, it's, and then he dictated a speech to be read at his own memorial service, which is quite amazing. Now, you can, if you go to victorzamet.com forward slash Montague, you can listen to these tapes. They're absolutely fantastic. His third visit in, um, 2000, in November, this is really interesting um, because he talked uh, about David coming to Australia and he, do, he did, he shows that he knows exactly what's going on and he told, he said, them, uh, I hope that he contacts Victor Zermatt when he gets to Australia. It's, it's a really interesting tape. This one here is when he was, when he uh, later on after David did come to Australia, when we were sitting and he came through to talk to Victor and myself. This is the noise of the ectoplasm being pulled out. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes we can hear you. Please, could you speak up? Yes. Yes, yes we can hear you. Yes. Welcome. <coughs> Montague. Oh, Montague. Oh, Montague. Oh, lovely. So lovely to meet you. How are you? How are you? Very, 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 very well, Montague. Very wonderful to see you here. Victor Zamet, are you here? Yes, I am. Oh, hello, Victor. <laughs> How are you? And your good wife, I trust, oh. she's well. Yes, I'm here too, Montague. Oh, hello. Hello, how are you? L uh, very pleased that you could make it tonight. Wonderful. Well, I just wanted to, to tell you that I'm going to be working with you from the other side. Oh, that's yeah, so that's wonderful. That's lovely. That's good, yes. So, you can do your bit on this side. Yes. And I will do mine yeah. on the other side. Yeah. And we will do it together. Yeah. That's very exciting. Very exciting. Well, I can't hang around as 
some are people who wish to speak. <laughs> Montague, yes. before you go, yes, yes. Um, a few times I've talked to v v Veronica. Yes, Ver oh my dear Veronica. Yes. yes. Would you, do you have anything for me to, to, to re relate to her? Oh, please, yeah. could you tell her that it, the other night when she was startled and she was in the kitchen, that it was me behind her. <laughs> right. Ma I'll Mont do that. Montague? Yes. yes, my dear. I'm from the same home country as your wife, and I'm going there next month. Would you like me to deliver that in person? Well, she doesn't live there anymore. Oh, doesn't she? Okay. No. Oh, she's in London. Ah, oh, I see. She lives in London. Mm. Well, uh, I, I'd like to bid you all good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much. Good evening, Montague. And thank you for coming here. Oh, my pleasure. And give my regards to Gary Swartz. Oh, yes, please. I will. Absolutely. Oh, thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good Right. Well, I think you'll agree that they're pretty spectacular tapes. I mean, how can that be the collective unconscious? How can that be, you know, there's so much humanity there. There's so much of the personality. Now, these tapes were authenticated by his wife, Veronica. Unfortunately, I've only got four. There were at least another three. And on one occasion, he did come through, Veronica said. He walked across the room, he embraced her, and they danced together. Um, pretty spectacular stuff, the return of Montague Keane. Well, um, any reactions? Let's hear from you. What do you think about direct voice mediumship? For me, this is like, um, when you compare this to EVP with a little, I love you, when you're comparing to a half an hour talk directly between loved ones, there is absolutely no comparison. And I think independent direct voice is like, for me, it's the holy grail of mediumship. Uh, research. Let's hear from you. Let's hear, put, just put your hands up. Anything you'd like to hear. Can we hear from any of our other uh, mediums, anyone who's experienced it, um, anyone who'd like to share? David Wright. Uh, yeah, as I said before, Wendy, when I was talking to you earlier, I saw Gary Mannion a couple months ago, and I didn't believe 100%. I didn't, it, uh, I was pretty close to it, but after I went to that seance with him and saw all the things that he did, that quenched it right there. That's where I, I believe that it is all true, that there is an afterlife. So these physical mediumships, they do hit, play a very important part of converting people to, to believers, as it did with me. Thanks, David. Inga, maybe, you, maybe you'd like to just share some of your Ex incredible experiences. Um, some of the things. What are the, some of the things with Dave, with Gary? Your what I call the oh my god moments. Um, probably in regards to um, direct voice was when he just started coming here in 2013 or yeah 2013. We had two nights of seance uh, following each other and um, in the first night there were only eight of us like Wendy was there and Victor and some other people who were invited to come by the spirit team and um, they we were sitting in a row and we could feel people standing in front of us and talking to us and somebody took my hand and he put something in my hand and closed my hand and he goes, I am so grateful for you allowing me to work here and to be here. And I'm going, yeah, no worries, anytime. I didn't really know what to do with it. And then later on when we all opened our, uh, our hand because some others got uh, tiles too, we noticed it was, I had a box in the corner of the room with uh, scrabble tiles. And so they had put names, 
like Imelda's husband Tony's letters, this gentleman Colin, which he then later confirmed in other seances that was his name, and then some other people. So I go, oh my God, that is really amazing. So then the next night we had a seance and there were five different communicators speaking to loved ones. And I could, one was so close, like I could hear the conversation and it was just a normal everyday conversation. And it was just like, oh my God, they are really here. They really, and the people were saying they're holding my hand, I get a hug. Um, one gentleman, we had music playing, walked out of the cabinet, we could hear footsteps, then changed the music. So the music lady goes, hey, somebody took the music out of my hand, changed the music to a song we didn't know was on the playlist and we, it wasn't, walked through the room and said to a lady in the back, darling, this is our song. And then they had a conversation and it was her husband and that was their wedding song. Wow. And, you know, she cried for an hour and a half, so did most of us. <laughs> so that was a bit of a, I just was an introduction to it, really. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is all so real. I think, I look, I, I completely agree with you, Inga. The first time uh, I think uh, um, was the first sounds I was in was at Jean's place, Jean and David's place. And I heard a voice here, William right in my ear and then I heard the voice come here right in my ear talking to me and it, it was like oh my god this is real um it is it is unbelievable when you have that Karen Richards would you like to share Karen Richards is a developing physical medium would you like to share some of your a, a highlight just one highlight oh I've got two or I could just say two the first one was the very first science I ever went into with David Thompson. And I never had said in the science before, was scared of spirit actually. And the little boy came around with his little face glowing in front of everyone. And he skipped straight past me and I said, oh, I didn't get to see. And the little boy comes back with the tile and he says, sorry, missus, how could I miss you? And literally to my face was a little face talking to me that was I was gone after that and I think the most memorable is Gary because Gary has unbelievable communication with every aspect of physical mediumship but um, we have a friend who was very very low but we didn't know he was almost suicidal so low and he was requested by Mrs Barnaby Gary's communicator to come through and she would bring his family through. And the spirit world came the night before and everything. So we sat in two seances one after another. Anyway, we were sitting in the room. He was requested to come in. And Mrs Barnaby, the communicator through the trumpet, talks to the sitter and asks him to stand up. And one by one by one in the, in the spirit world, she lined up his family and they all got to speak to him. Now, that's literally saved his life because his, all his family had just passed, his brother had just passed, and he was only a young guy on his own. And wasn't that, Inga, that was just so beautiful. I think they are two most memorable for me. Thank you, Karen. Thank um, you. Can I just quickly just call on Paul and Cyan, just one memorable moment for you from your physical, your years of physical. I mean, I, this, I think we'll have to get Paul and Cyan on to talk about their physical mediumship, but um, I know they've we been had, doing uh, it for so long. Paul? We had, we had John Sloan talk in the room uh, and we recorded it and mm -hmm. his voice was just floating around in the air. Yeah, so independent direct voice isn't that uncommon yeah. in this house with us. In your house. Yeah. <laughs> science, but science, I've got a great story. Uh, yeah, but that's with... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Were you want me to talk Bill Mendes? Yeah. yeah, someone was just talking about seeing the little heads. Is, Karen. If anyone, Karen. Yeah, yeah. I sat with... I was, very, I was in England for a long time and I was lucky to sit with Bill Meadows new, on numerous occasions. I don't know if anyone sat with Bill Meadows. Ah, blown away. 
I the sto- I could go on for hours about this, but the the, cu- the short story is there was a floating luminous plaque. It went round a circle of about twenty five people. As it came round the circle, there was a fully materialized three D head uh, in the glow of the luminous plaque. The the luminosity of the plaque was up lighting this three D. It looked like a like a three D holog- holographic projection, and this head was moving and talking and introducing itself to people as it came round to every single person, no more than like a couple of foot at max in front of your face. You know, it was dim red light. So you, enough light, you can see there's no, no hocus pocus going on. I mean, you know, Bill Meadows seances were absolutely out of this world. Uh, and the, the end, you could feel the breath when he was talking. And the you could literally eyes, feel and- the breath. Yeah, and then well, he goes, he was oh, all in my it. face. You were there that night, good. weren't you? Yeah, F- what was his name? Father Jack, wasn't it? Father Jack. Father, was uh, uh, Father James. Father James, yes. He literally James came around. Jonathan. Yeah, and he would introduce himself. Oh, God, love, lovely to meet you, lovely to meet you, Lala. And you'd be just like, yes, <laughs> it's awesome <laughs> to meet you too. And you're just you, so stunned. You, you just sort of gobsmacked. You don't quite know what oh, to say. Just awesome, believe it. Awesome, yeah. awesome, awesome, awesome. Diane, did you not shake Jonathan's hand when he came up? Oh, I, I shook that hand many, on many occasions. <laughs> yeah, many I shook occasions. his hand twice. I was, I was lucky to be invited the into girls, the cabinet. The and, yeah, the little and girl comes in. Comes Maria, in. and I, could, I got to hug her in the cabinet, and she put her fully materialised, tiny little nine, ten-year-old arms around up. me. She puts yeah. her hands behind you, goes down your back, up and down. Yeah. Yeah, and then the yeah. two, the two, the twin sister, brother and sister, they, they come push out. their bodies out to the front. Yeah. And you the see babies. the whole outline yeah. with, their, with the curtain. Yeah, yeah, amazing. So I think that, I think everybody's getting the idea that physical mediumship is pretty exciting, it's and awesome. um, it, it's, it's such a gift to humanity. And yet, the sad thing is that it's constantly derided, even by spiritualists who say it's totally fraudulent. Gary? Gary Langley. Just another thing, if I could go back to yes, Wendy and Inge. When you, when, when you had John Sloan come over with Tom and Kevin, you all attended them with Irene and uh, Phil Starr and John Campbell. What did you think to them? Me? Are you yeah. talking to me? Yeah, Inge. Both, both, both Wendy and Inge, you were both there. When, when yes. Tom and Kevin came over and Irene and Phil Starr, yes. I mean, when I, when I transcripted all that, I mean, your reactions to everything that was going well, on. Well, it was just, yeah, like everything else, I am always just in awe of what, what is possible <clears throat> and cannot understand that people not even want to explore it, you know? It is so yeah, when true. You, when the you more you talk- can... Inga, what about the time the chair broke? Inga, what about the time the chair broke and Tom John Lennon, broke? John Lennon singing in front of us. Sorry, oh, yeah. sorry, Paul, what was this about the chair? I was sitting in front of the, the cabinet with Inga and my chair broke. We all laughed. I was laying on the floor and I could see through the dim red light this chair floating out of the cabinet with Tom strapped to it. And because I was laying on the floor with my head on the floor, I could see that much gap between the floor and the chair, and they dropped the chair about a half a centimetre from my chest, <laughs> right? I mean, I had never, ever sat on a physical seance before, and that stuff that I saw with Tom was absolutely amazing. What do you reckon, Inga? Oh, it is, 100%. Or, you know, a table which uh, three people needed to lift because it was so bloody big and heavy, you know, one of the really old wooden tables. <laughs> couple of hundred years old, floated, just floated past me. And I'm going, that it's not possible that that could be the table floating. It's so, so heavy. <laughs> and everyone was holding hands. So the table, was, that's not possible. And there the table was in the middle. You know, it was just... And the skeptics will thousands. tell you it's group psychokinesis. Gary Langley, you've had your hand up for a while. Well, nothing as interesting as what I'm listening to because you guys are fascinating. <laughs> Um, and this may be a matter of semantics. I was having a, a conversation with Riley Haggerty, and uh, 
I interchanged the term direct voice and independent voice. And he corrected me and said, direct voice is with a trumpet. Independent voice is just in the room. Does anyone else make that distinction? Because I hear all of us. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's the classic distinction. So that okay. the independent direct voice is independent of the trumpet, not independent of the medium. So, uh, so that's, where, and, that's where it comes from. And the yeah. only other thing I wanted to add is, I, I, you know, mediumship. And I know some of you here that are mediums may experience some of this, but even uh, mental mediums, most of the good ones I know don't have their gallbladders anymore. They've had to have them removed. It seems to be a physical toll that mediumship in all forms uh, can take. So okay. I just wonder if anyone has any insight on that. Yeah, I think the the um, the Winbridge Institute recently did something. I think on the health of mediums. It's one of the. It's but it's a bit difficult to get a cause effect thing though, because you know there's so many other variables that can happen. Jane Ingman, can I just quickly get you to perhaps share some of your experiences with David Thompson? Because Jane was and David were David Thompson's circle leaders for many years. Um, so, and they've had a lot of amazing experiences. Well, David, David sat with us um, and a lot of other bereaved parents. That was the, the group um, that David came to. Um, and uh, we all... Um, had some communication with our, it was all sons, we all had communication with our sons. Um, and then there was one memorable occasion where um, two ladies came who had lost their small children to cancer. And uh, one of the ladies, her uh, daughter, fiddled with her earrings and sat on her lap and said things to her. And then when the, the mother went home and got to her car, somebody who knew her had put a message on her windscreen to say that Bryony, that was the little girl's name, had appeared to her and told her that she had been speaking to her mother. And um, that it was all very, it was evidential to the people concerned, which was, um, you know, it was lovely, absolutely lovely. And another thing you're talking about um, moving tables and things, David um, invariably finished up, he was strapped in the chair, but he invariably finished up with the chair, the four legs of the chair, on a table that was barely big enough to take the size of the chair. Um, so when the lights went back on, there was David strapped in the chair, uh, sitting on this, this table, this coffee table. So uh, that was quite interesting <laughs> we we had a cabinet we, the room was 100 percent darkened um it was so dark that in fact one day when it was sunny uh, unfortunately it broke our windows because <laughs> they obviously got too hot with the black behind them um uh so it was you couldn't you definitely could not see anything the trumpet used to fly around all over the place um David would take things like snatch my David's glasses off his face um, and then put them back, um, or rather spirit, I'm, I should have said spirit, would snatch my David's uh, glasses off his face, put them back, which could have been very dangerous because it could have just poked him straight in the eye. Uh, there was all, all sorts of things that, that could happen. But again, the, the whole thing is, although it's fun and games, the whole thing is very spiritual. And yes. th there, there is this strong emphasis on love. Now, Inga, what we, we, we uh, you, what were you sa saying about the, the, the spirit world wants physical mediumship to develop in the home circle? And th I know this is a, a great thing that Craig is on to. Well, um, well, they they have said um, that they want the, uh, the people stay in home circle in their own home circles because that's where the development is happening and yeah there's still some public mediums out there of course but um yes they were talking about that the reason they sort of drove the mediums back into home circle is for 
for the development to happen. You know, like people always talk about this amazingly, we heard a lot of amazing mediums in the past. But really, when you think about it, it is there were friends and family. They didn't watch TV all day. They didn't have internet. They didn't worry about uh, Facebook. What are my mates saying? How many likes are gonna get? There was none of that. Their, their entertainment was getting together and hoping for their loved ones to come to have a chat. Like a friend of mine would have a medium, they would have coffee, they set up on Sundays, they set up the coffee table. And as soon as the medium had the first sip of coffee, he never got to the cake, they took him into trance and then they would around the coffee table have for three hours of conversation with spirit about anything and everything. I mean, today you can't really imagine that that would happen, but people would get together and that was their purpose. That was their interest. That was their trust. That was the harmony, you know, and they could develop amazing mediumship. But today it is not that way anymore. So the reason I guess, I believe that they want them back in home circle. They want to develop them in a trusting environment. And we're talking about research now at the moment, Wendy and I talk about that research uh, symposium coming up. But it is, you know, I have a real concern. Why do they want to do research? Why don't they want to do research in how it is done? How can spirit explain how it's done? How can we move forward? What do they need? Now, I worry that the, the only aim of that research is, is a medium fraudulent? Or is he not? Because it can't possibly happen because it's not real. It's, you know, we live in matter. So I really think, you know, that we need to think about if there is research, in home circles, it would be great. You okay. sit with them and, you know, I just, I'm a bit confused with all of this. Let me bring Craig in on this. I know, Craig, this is, this is you, you're speaking, reading, you're playing Craig's favorite song. Craig? Yeah. I feel, song. <laughs> yeah. I feel so much the importance of the home circles that, that that's going to make the difference. And what we've done is uh, we started the circle here in central Illinois just to to co collaborate, corroborate, collaborate with uh, those on the other side. And so we started it here out of nothing and we invited uh, five people. And after uh, several years, actually about a dozen years, we have everybody in the circle developing in some way. And they've told us that it's an experimental circle that what they're doing is they're trying to show that a circle can meet anywhere with any group of people and they will honor that and they will in some way develop the the abilities within that circle and all people have to do is sit and so when we have circles like this all over the world then people are going it's going to be a tremendous tremendous witness to the fact that there's a survival of consciousness. So we really need to develop these circles. And if people stop sitting in church for an hour and a half every week and sit in a circle, then uh, they'll get much more spiritual feeding from it than they would sitting in a church. And internet is perfect. Everyone can sit at home. They don't even have to travel anymore. Yeah, we have our Wednesday evening circle. So we have a Wednesday evening circle that meets and uh, we are having wonderful uh, experiences. Uh, people in each one of their locations all around the world. And uh, we sit for an hour and uh, we raise our vibration by singing just the same way as in a traditional uh, seance. And then we have physical manifestations in each one of our locations, people being touched, uh, the sounds of raps and taps, uh, people having ex experiences of, uh, of feeling cobwebby feelings, the same feelings that you get in a physical mediumship circle. And so what, what's that that's doing is it's developing the Zoom ability to have these circles, but then also helping people to develop so that then they can have their own home circles where they are. So it's, it's disseminating it. It's getting it out there. So uh, that's the experiment right now, and it's being very successful. Awesome. Karen, how are you going with your circle? 
Karen well, Richards? It's very interesting um, Craig says that. And honestly, Craig is a fantastic ambassador for the spirit world. If you've ever sat in anything of his, he's, he's very open and he's very encouraging. And you really need people like that. There's no competition. It's all about sharing. Circles are formed because they're batteries for one another, I believe. You know, uh, they feed off of one another. They build from one another. Our circle, we've had so much phenomena. We've got um, indirect, independent boys. We've had that for ages. Um, we have a new phenomena where the table moves from a group come to me, energy forms, the table gets pushed away, it stands on two legs, and we've had this thing going on where energy comes from the, the ceiling and faces are forming in the energy like a TV screen on the table and they just, have, they just look around, they just change faces, but the table's independent of me but still connected to me, standing on two legs in front of the sitters like a TV, and then the energy comes from the cabinet. I'm in the cabinet over the top and then all these spaces are shown again. So much fun. And the table is electrified. There's all like um, electric shocks all over the table. So I don't know where it's going to go, but I love it. I, if anyone knows me, I'm the one that says, oh, come on, let's have a sit. Oh, come on, you want to try this? Let's do spoon bending. Let's do telekinesis. And I do really think if we sit and like Craig says, let spirit do the work, then we've got no problems. Mm. It's interesting and that, um, Inga, that physical mediumship came to the fore in bad times, didn't it? Like the American mass Civil passing. War, the First World War, times of mass passing. And that's one, one of the reasons at the moment that they are bringing physical mediumship back. Because back we back to the forefront, coming. which is interesting. Jane Lentz. Yes, hello. This is a wonderful, um, wonderful group. And my question is for Craig. So, are you recording your seances? Are you? How are you memorializing them so that you provide, I guess, proof of your experiences? <coughs> We're doing that. We, we're recording the Wednesday evening experiences that people are having, plus the discussion afterwards, which is where we find out things because we're in different locations. Uh, and also our Sunday night circle, the circle of the masters of light, which is that's the experimental circle that they have decided that they are going to show that they can develop a circle anywhere. And so we are right now we're recording it in uh, out in infrared. And uh, we're also then making notes about it because we, they've told us that they want us to disseminate this, to get the word out about it, about the, the development. And we're trying to encourage other circles to do the same. Circles are so secretive. Uh, mm -hmm. The you know, circles, they just, yeah. they, they don't want to talk about what the, what's going on in their circle and they shouldn't, they should be sharing it. You know, they should, we should be developing our circles together. And so that, that's one of the, the uh, impetuses uh, that we have for our development within the circle. So we, yes, we are recording it and we're going to disseminate it. And that's one of, the, one of the things we have found is that the circles will work together, that you'll find one circle will get phenomena and next thing you know, other circles will be getting the same thing. Would you agree with that, Inga, that it's, it's something that you, you see them cooperation? So I'm... I just was opening the chat. I didn't oh, hear sorry. you. sorry. Do the circles work together on different parts of the world? Yes. In uh, Kai has a lot of groups um, where they created circles. And I think Hans actually visits them. So, you know, brings them together a little bit. And, um, but in Europe, it is like Karen and I wanted to go traveling and we are talking, okay, where can we sit? So it is just due to people I know and I know they're sitting, some, they're sitting somewhere and then they say, yeah, we ask if you can come and sit or we ask. So 
It is not that easy if you want to even sit as a, as a visitor somewhere in a different country and go, oh, maybe I just would love to come as a visitor for your circle. It is really, really, really hard to find. So they, the spirit people say, we learn something with one medium, we try it with others, we adjust it because every medium is different, every energy is different. So we will adjust it, but like a pause now. I mean, Gary never had a pause. Now he has a pause. He goes, where is that coming from? I go, well, they're practicing. So I think there are not 5,000 spirit teams who work with physical as much. They give us a different name, but I don't think there are that many personalities. I think it's more for our benefit, because, you know, in the past mediums would fight over a communicator because the communicator turned some, up somewhere else and said his name. And then the mediums had a fight. I mean, really? You don't own them. They're not your servants. So I don't, I don't believe that there are millions of people in the spirit world who want to work with physical mediums. They are experts and they work with many, many circles. That's interesting. One of the, for me, one of the evidential things is when um, people get the same message from different physical circles. So, for example, I can remember Ron Jilks was saying uh, he mm -hmm. ran a, a, a little centre in England. His, da his daughter materialised through four different physical mediums, which I think is, is kind of evidential. And then there are, another, another case was... Um, uh, Elizabeth Pretty, she got a message. Her father materialised in Sydney through David Thompson. And then she went to England and he materialised again through Stuart Alexander and referenced the fact that he'd come through in Sydney. Now, to me, that, that is really good evidence of the kind of thing of the independence of the spirit from the medium. Whereas most of the parapsychologists will say, it's the medium's unconscious which is projecting this into the ectoplasm. Um, you know, whereas, you know, what we're, we're, we're up against is this whole idea of showing the independence of... You know, th th there are a lot of people who will say, oh, yes, physical mediumship exists, but it is created solely by the people who are there. Uh, and, and that's where we... We're, to me, that's where direct voice comes through. I can understand psychokinesis being... Uh, generated by the you know the energy of the group but when you get montague keen coming through with such detailed detailed personality i cannot believe that is created by the group energy it's it's crazy giles you've got a question It's uh, more of a statement um, to, of encouragement for what uh, you and Victor are doing. Um, from your website, there are 50, about 50 things to know before you go. So I got into discussion with a local nearby and I printed these out and gave them to him. He uh, is in a homeless shelter in a nearby town with about 110,000 people. He chose seven persons to show these guidelines to, each of whom said approximately, amazing, yes, not like the silliness in the Bible. Why is this information not made more widely available? Well, we're trying. <laughs> a chosen set of persons, but still a 100% success rate. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, that Giles, for that lovely feedback. And yes, I, I can always remember one of uh, one of uh, the communicators, I think it was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle came through and he was talking to John Poynton of the Society for Psychical Research. And he said, John, he says, stop pussyfooting around. You've got to start making a statement. You've got to make start making a stand for the afterlife. This, you know, this nonsense about saying well the skull experiment might have been this and it might have been that and it could have been he says stop pussyfooting and, and then he says you've got and i can always remember we said to william william what can we do to get this message out he said you've got to shout loudly you know don't hold back shout loudly he says so yes well i i think you can see that having had these experiences victor and i were, were so fortunate 
to have had these experiences. And once you have these experiences, I've got a tape, I must find it, where my father materialized, walked across the room, talked to me about uh, personal things, kissed me and pushed a piece of paper into my hand with his signature on it. Now, that's not just for me. Once you've had these experiences, you have to, you have to start sharing them. And that's the thing about physical mediumship. It, uh, Craig, you've had some amazing experiences with physical medium. What was some of the highlights for you? Well, I think the, the highlights that I had were, were with David Thompson. And of course, the, the wonderful experiences that we had. Um, I had Quentin Chris put his hand over my head. <laughs> uh, and in the, same, in the same seance, then William came around and put his hand on my head. And you feel that William's immense hand and then Quentin Crisp's little hand, and just to have them stand in front of you and do that is just a, an, an incredible experience. It tells you so much about the reality of, of the life after this life. And so that was a really wonderful experience for me. Thank you. Paul and Cyan, what were some of your amazing experiences? Well, I mean, you, I know you're working now with ETs. Uh, perhaps if you could just give people a bit of a rundown about your your past and your present work. Uh, well, we literally sat last night, um, so that's quite recent. <laughs> and um, my old uh, circle leader, uh, Travis, came through, which was really lovely. He um, came through in uh, what looked like from the other side of the room, a big blob of ectoplasm all over Paul's head. Um, pushed his face through uh, it, to the extent his glasses rims caught the uh, the light, the light that we have a red light on. And it the light reflected on the rim of his glasses. Or Paul wasn't wearing glasses. <laughs> so, that, you know, that was something going, you know, you could literally see the glass of his glasses over his eyes. Um, it was that clear and was able to say a few words, which... It wasn't you know, even supposed to be a physical. We system. weren't even. Yeah, we were supposed to have an ET sitting last night, but that didn't happen. And spirit people came instead. So you know that that was that was great. You know, a it wasn't what we were expecting, and b it was my old circle leader, which was lovely. Um, you know, we did have a craft come two months ago and land. Well, that's ET but, stuff. You know, I know nobody cares about <laughs> ET stuff. But that's okay. Of course, people yeah. care about ET stuff. Oh, I'm joking. I'm joking because the thing is with Skull, and I loved Robin's work. And I bought his book and read it. The ET were working in with spirit people there. Yeah. I mean, that's what people need to understand. There was that that, that collaboration between it, mm -hmm. and it's not just always all about spirit people. God bless spirit people; we love them to death. But there's this whole range of things that are available for everybody. We had we had independent direct voice about six months ago. We mm -hmm. were we were just getting ready for um, a, a sitting. Um, I can't remember what, what we were sitting for that night, but. Outside of the seance room in the lounge, we had an Irish, uh, one of the Irish guides we work with. He started talking in the lounge. I was like, hang on, <laughs> you're in the wrong room. <laughs> so that was, that was really good. I mean, but we don't, it's, it's the thing is, we us. actually don't try. And, I, and, and this is what I think is really important. We just get on with it. And I think yeah. if people just get on with it and just sit <laughs> and relax <laughs> about it <laughs> and don't try too much, that things work much faster. Yeah. You know, that's the thing is the more I was told in the beginning that the more we try, the worse we make it for spirit people. Mm -hmm. And Silver Birch, there it is right there. The activity of our world is the silence of ours. That's all it comes down to. Yeah. So sitting, it, it's really interesting. Inga and I were talking about this. Why don't we know more about physical mediumship in uh, developing countries in India, in China and Africa? It must be going on. Yeah. And Inga's sure. hypothesis is it's so much part of the, the awareness the and the culture that they don't need it. Because that's right. You know, that's interesting that you say that, Wendy, because if you're in Townsville and you, you mention physical mediumship to people, they've got no idea what you're talking about. But if you talk about loved ones or, or curtains lifting up and being straight in the room during daylight. Or ancestors. And, and ancestors, they know exactly what you're talking about. Just a different uh, framework of reference, different cultural framework. Knocking on walls, lights in the room, big round orbs floating around. The, the, and they don't call them sittings, they just get-togethers, you know. We did a beautiful... Um, Corroboree with them up on the up on the mountains, mm -hmm. and an extraterrestrial craft uh, lit up the sky for them. 
they loved it yeah as the the female shaman was in in trance doing her thing around the circle you know like so it's you know how do you separate that you can't, you can't. <laughs> absolutely fascinating uh, mm. louis and livia in brazil what's the situation there with physical mediumship i mean is it is it unnecessary like what, what was yeah no look the point is ah uh, first and foremost I'd like to thank you wendy wonderful wonderful presentation right and matches so much with i think it's a very good combination with the spiritist knowledge and all this phenomena that comes from the work you people from these english-speaking countries do i think this is very important in my opinion there should be a, a world front that you could get together and take it very seriously and spread the word most to young people these days right because young people these are the the people the, the the generations that will be responsible to take the message of uh ahead yeah? but saying about this in brazil i'm trying with my channel spirit connection i'm trying to do exactly this right to, to bring this message because in brazil and there's another problem i think not only in brazil but africa and other countries the religion is sometimes a problem right uh this kind of uh, drawback religion and dogmas and, and sometimes it hinders and the spirits say this to us it hinders the uh, situation of the the word being spread in a more in a freer and more evolved, evolved way so i think uh, uh there must be i think this front of you and mick victor zemlet wendy you've been responsible to have this uh, front all over the world but uh, i think uh, the more people like this group for example get together and uh, the dedicate time to do something really serious about that to and I know uh, I think it's going to be very important and to bring some basic truths that tackles the theological side of the dominant, which you do. I read your afterlife report and see you and Victor you usually tackle this, this kind of a look. Theology usually says this, but uh, actually what we've been seeing in terms of evidence is this. This is something that is a world discussion, so important, psychologically important. Uh, the world needs nowadays this kind of thing because we are under this kind of mental and uh, physical war. And I think uh, in Brazil, no, in Brazil, I think because of Protestantism has spread a lot in Brazil. And even nowadays has been more difficult for you to say you are a spiritist here than in the past. So I think these are all reasons that evidence starts getting... Uh, weighing down a little, into a little bit, right? Uh, people will kind of run away, even the spiritists I've seen running away from evidence. <laughs> and they sometimes, from the, some spiritists, they just say, no, spiritism is a philosophy, which is not. It's a philosophy, yes, but based on evidence that comes from phenomena. You understand? And this Absolutely. is our Alan Kardec's word. Absolutely. Okay, it's that comes from the phenomena. It's not from uh, philosophical speculation alone. Right, so that's the point. And the, and the situation, I think it could be better than it is now. And I thank you very much, Wendy, for this kind of work you're doing. Thank you, uh, Louis and Livia. Um, well, I think we'll end it at that point. And I'd just like to say thank you to, our, to everybody for being here and participating, but particularly I'd like to thank Inga and Paul and Cyan and all of our other physical mediums who are mediums here who've uh, come along today. Uh, Karen Richards came along from Perth, where the time is much earlier than Sydney. So uh, thank you, Karen, for getting up early. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about uh, physical mediumship, please read those references and listen to those tapes. And the Leslie Flint tapes, the Leslie, th this is what Leslie Flint was doing. He was absolutely incredible. He's the real deal. Uh, well and truly, if if you want to have now that reminds me, the Annie Nanji tapes are absolutely brilliant. Inga, you were telling me that Annie Nanji is coming through to others. Yes, you see, I wasn't not very much aware of um, Leslie Flint, um, and so I had a lady sitting here, and this this communicator comes through and she was so upbeat and she was so funny 
and she goes oh you know my name is Annie and uh and she was we just having a conversation and so when I talked about her later uh the medium goes yeah that is uh, one of the ladies who came and spoke to her husband via Leslie Flint and I go oh yeah you know and then uh a month later or so Sandy Ingham was here and we had a sit with that lady and as the first word of that any lady speaking Sandy goes oh my god I know exactly who this is I know this voice inside out and so this communicator made comments to her that you know that they obviously had met somewhere and um so yeah she is uh working with this medium now and she is saying she was saying i was in in adelaide not long ago and i spoke to her there and um she was saying exactly what everybody is saying this needs to be further though there is no leslie flint now but all the communicators there are so many communicators who want to get their message across and she was talking about sitting in circles please give us the time you know we can bring you the evidence and exactly the same thing it was good this very upbeat beautiful lady Annie is absolutely if, if you really want to to uh, hear something amazing the Annie Nancy tapes Annie spoke Annie died she I think she she came through We've got about at least 20 tapes of her, her talking to I've her got husband. Of her. You've got 35, Tom. Uh, I think there were actually more, but her husband, uh, Dinshaw, <coughs> would travel to England from uh, Sweden every six months to sit with Leslie Flint, and he would talk with his deceased wife. And those tapes would go for about half an hour each through through direct voice and she would talk to him about you know little things like oh you know the bedspread you've changed the bedspread you need a new hat uh you need this you need that and they would chat backwards and forwards and uh he would ask it uh, she would tell him oh um i've got my deceased children with me and uh, i've got the dog i've got the parrot i've got the parrot we used to have a parrot i've got that with me they are just such amazing everyday conversations. They're very, very persuasive that life goes on. So thank you, everybody, um, for indulging my interest in physical mediumship today. And uh, as, you, as you know, it's something that, that when people have, the, have got involved in it, they become passionate about it. And uh, you, you'll find that there's, it's a very small circle all over the world. Uh, those people who who talk with each other about physical mediumship because there's not met that many people you can talk about ectoplasm with they really they, they go oh you know work of the devil <laughs> get away we're from working me. on that <laughs> Wait, before you leave yes sir. Uh, wouldn't it be possible for you to do something in america or in australia just focusing this subject and inviting people of the world have you ever done this already well, Craig is very keen to to do to do this. I mean, we um, we organised for two physical mediums to go to the AREI conference in uh, America. I think that's the first time that David Thompson and uh, what's the other guy, uh, Scott. Scott Milligan, had been to America, and that exposed a lot of people to physical mediumship in America to good physical mm -hmm. mediumship. And uh, we organized that three times for, the, for them to oh, go I there. So, because and, I was thinking about something that can use the resources that in the last five years we've uh, been at hands, like uh, Instagram and uh, you know, involving young people in a new fashion. Uh, absolutely. And, and I think Inga has been doing that. For the last 12 years, Inga has been traveling the world four or five times a year to different countries. And she goes to Brazil as well to uh, yes. sit with Madrado and uh, the circle, what's it, the city of light. Uh, and uh, I think Inga, Inga and Paul and Cyan are traveling the world. They've just come back from England and they're about to go to America later in the year. And Karen. Uh, and Karen, Karen as well. Uh, Karen is 
Karen, what are, you, are you doing public seances yet? Is Karen still with us? No, Not no, yet. I don't. I just um, sit with a little circle and then every so often I invite some friends, or they're nearly all mediums, for our anything goes night. And they know me really well and they come and we have a pizza and a drink and then we sit in the science room and we just say, let's go for it. And we have fantastic nights. That's, but I don't do it in public night. No, well, that, well the, there are all these little circles starting all over. Louise Herman has been sitting for physical mediumship for 12 years and she still sits, bless her heart, she sits in her caravan, which makes a perfect uh, cabinet <laughs> in the middle of, of, of nowhere. And uh, yeah, she, she's, she's getting some great results too. So, and, and I, don't, I don't know how we can, how I'm, we're open to this. We're, we're, um, we're going to be actually having a meeting fairly soon. Inga and I are involved in a meeting talking to the scientists at IONS about physical mm -hmm. mediumship. Wow. They're not going to like me, though. They're not going to like us, though. <laughs> That's the other Why thing. Why not? Why do you think not? <laughs> they're, they're, um, they're, they're, they've, they've got this attitude. I mean, some, some of you might know. Well, it's fear, but they, they really think it's all arrogance. fraudulent. It's, it's arrogance, exactly. And mm -hmm. interest, you know, even even if we convince them that physical mediumship is real, they will still not associate it with spirit. For them, the A word is the afterlife. They will not use the word afterlife. They will talk about consciousness. Mm -hmm. They will talk mm -hmm. about collective consciousness. They will talk about the unconscious. They'll talk in Jungian terms, but they do not. Well, they will not talk about individual survival. Even if they're mediums, for God's sake. Yes, they, because interesting, Wendy, because uh, they're one of the directors, I think, Wannabe. I think her name is Helen Wannabe. Yeah, Helen. And, Helen. And Helen. Helena, and she's yes. a medium and she channels books. And, and, yeah. But even so. She won't use the A word, not with the scientists around. It's all uh, consciousness. A consciousness, <laughs> interconnectedness. Interconnectedness. Right? Yes, you know, that's it. Um, uh -huh. you know, for goodness sake, I, I can always remember uh, Victor used to say to our circle, we used to laugh because they used to say, oh, you know, uh, when Louis Armstrong is, is uh, Victor used to say, I don't believe collective consciousness can make Louis Armstrong walk across the room and say hello, Dolly. <laughs> you know, it's like, show me if you if you think you can get a group together and create energy to do that, I will be convinced of your collective consciousness. This is but, dogma. So this is a scientism. It, it, it's a scientism. It's a scientific yeah, dogma. Scientism. It is. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Now, don't forget, Paul and Cyan are doing regular groups. When, when are your groups, uh, Cyan? You're pretty up to date uh, with it. Yeah, they're the uh, every second and fourth. Uh, I think we've changed it to Saturday. It to Saturday. <laughs> we have changed every it to second Saturday and now. Look at, look at our group, uh, group schedule on, on the Friday Afterlife Report. On the second and fourth Saturday, they're doing work uh, groups, which we call uh, we're calling it. What, what's the name of your group? Metaphysics? Practical Metaphysics. Practical Metaphysics. Which yeah, involves, and we're, uh, sorry. we're halfway through a guide work, a uh, series of guide work sessions at the moment. Yeah, it's so based around people doing their own work for themselves and um, getting their own building, contact. building their own skill level up. Just back to one step where we talked before. You were talking about scientists. We we do a lot of work in the background with scientists, and and they're the most difficult people to work with. I mean, mm -hmm. it just. It doesn't matter what you do, what evidence you give, what, what is said, it's just never enough. We've been yeah. contacted by some fairly high-level organisations and scientists and they'll sit and talk to you for two to three hours or whatever and it just, it's so frustrating. It really is. In our last week's Friday Afterlife report, there was an article by Montague Keane. He wrote it two years after the Skull Report. And he was saying exactly that. You know, he's saying you're coming up with the most improbable hypotheses and you're treating yeah. them yeah. as if they're truth. It 
please read it. It is the most sensational, articulate article I have ever read. It is just beautifully expressed. And this there's is, a book too. Sorry? A book written by him and uh, David Fontana. They are talking about and discussing the situation of the refusal from the SPR to the evidence, you know. It's exactly. a very strong book, this one. Yeah, yeah. David Fontana, the, well, the three of them who were, who, the three Society for Psychical Research um, investigators who they investigated the skull evidence. There was David Fontana, Arthur Ellison, and Montague Keane. And they wrote the skull a report on it. And this is their frustration. This is why Montague comes through. And I'm sure he's still very active and uh, passionate about this because he was so frustrated. He was the head of the Society for Psychical Research survival team. And he it 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 drove him crazy that these you know academics just would not um could not get past their, their own uh, intellect. And this is one of the things that we find, Inga, in a circle. They make the best, the worst sitters, don't they? In, mm -hmm. fa in fact, if you have somebody turn up to a physical seance with that skeptical mindset, the phenomena will stop because, you know, it, it just interferes with the phenomena so badly. No harmony. No harmony in the group. You know, the, the, the best sitters are, are people who, who just have no expectations who, who have and who have fun. Uh, you probably listen from the tapes that the, the group is, is fun. It, it's funny. It, it's uh, people are joking and laughing with each other. And that's you may the find, energy. Wendy, that a lot of the scientists now, they're seeking evidence of healing. So they're seeking documentation previous to the healing and documentation after and they're building, without you know people knowing about this, they're building bodies of evidence for the uh, you know reality of spirit life and ET and all the rest of it. They're, this this is becoming a big body of work for that to present that as an evidence. But there's so many different groups doing it. And the interesting thing is, with these scientists, they don't want anybody to know that they're doing it. They won't put their names out there. We <laughs> we we had half a dozen scientists come and sit with David Thompson that we'd invited over the years. And they said, yes, I'm convinced. Yes, it's amazing. But no, I cannot tell anybody. I would lose my tenure. I would lose my exactly. funding. We um, heard that two months ago from somebody that interviewed us that's a scientist. Yeah. yeah. yeah and exactly. you, you had that a couple of years ago with that group from America. Yeah, we had a group from America. They said exactly yeah. 12 scientists said exactly the same thing. Yeah. So well, for well, hours and hours. If, if you go back a couple of years now, um, the Nobel Prize winner, Brian Josephson, won a no and because he was doing telepathy, he was uninvited from conferences <laughs> because he was studying telepathy. And they said, this man, you know, is un he's, he's betraying science. Telepathy, for God's sake. We're not talking yeah. about aliens in your lounge room we are talking telepathy <laughs> you know? and he, he's had a heck of a job you know look at Rupert Sheldrake he has mm. been crucified because he talked he said he claimed that animals can know when at the time when people are coming home they have telepathic communications with their humans anybody who's had a dog knows that the dog can yeah. read their mind for goodness sake you know, and they're, they're still so caught up in the whole materialist dogma. And uh, so on the one hand, we've got the materialists. On the other hand, we've got the religionists. So trying to actually forge that middle grounded evidence base. And, of course, then we've got the, the people who are with the fairies who will believe anything, you know, mm -hmm. who, are, who are sort of running around, um, you know, totally credulous. Hey, so, hey, hey, don't you back the fairies. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a fairy person and I'm not an angel person either. Okay. But I have been in sittings and they oh my my camera and they opened um like not it's not a portal but like a um a light, so to speak, and they would show me an angel, and it was so, so clear, and a fairy. 
And I'm going, oh, my God, I wish I could say I didn't see it, but I did see it. <laughs> Karen remembers. And I was going, oh, my God, that's really something. Uh, it's not really in my reality, not in my thinking. And they go, that's the reason, you see, because you also block what you can see by your belief. And then a gentleman who is a very stern very stern Englishman. He goes to me once, Inga, I have to tell you something. I go, oh, what is it? He goes, we have, what are they? What is in their circle? Karen, is it gnomes? No. Gnomes? The little people. What are the little people in the forest? What are they called? Elves? Element elementals. elementals. Yes. And he goes, I have elementals in my spirit team. And when I go to a seance, they bring their own light. And he goes, you would never believe it because I never believed it. And he goes, it is true. They're just saying, you know, just because you don't believe it, it makes you understand why other people don't believe stuff because it's their belief system what's interfering. I was going, oh, my God, I have to put my head in. <laughs> it matters my information, too. But what the spirits say is that we need sometimes to avoid, yes, this kind of, you know, daydreaming thing because it's difficult to get to the world, this kind of truth, and without mysticism, you know. Yeah. And But I think, yes, it matters the information. I think Anne Sheehan wants to say something. Right. Anne, did you want to say something, Anne? I'm sorry, Anne, I didn't see your hand up. That's all right. That's all right. Um, well, first, I'm just, I have to use the word gobsmacked. I'm so excited to hear this and so honored to be here. Thank you, Wendy, and everyone. Um, just so moved. But it's also reminding me of, um, I have, my family has a recording of my grandmother telling, uh, my Irish grandmother telling of hearing uh, the wail of the banshee when she was a little girl when there was a woman down the road um, who was having a child and my grandmother was walking with her mother and um, they heard this sound, which you can hear on the recording, my grandmother ec um, echoing this sound and it's bone chilling. And her mother dropped what she was carrying and she says with her bro, glory be to God, tis the will of the banshee. And she ran up the road and the woman and the child died. So, uh, for, for them, the little people were utterly, completely real. Mm. She, you know, the sound was there for everyone to hear, the will of the banshee. Thank little you, tiny Anne. stuff compared to everything I've heard today. Thank, Thank you. you so That's amazing. So, well, this is the kind of stuff that Kim Parker does in gatherings over strange happenings. Kim is a shaman, a trained shaman. And this is very much, uh, you know, the... the the work, the work of Indigenous people, the, their world is very much nature. I think, yes, I think we do have to keep an, a very open mind. I keep an open mind personally. I just say, okay, maybe yes, maybe no. But when we are communicating with people, we need to put the emphasis on things that are evidential. Um, if, Wait, if I've, we... just, I've just posted a, a site for you on the chat. And this is a man in England. And he goes, he goes into the forest. And he's got loads of little videos of showing the little forest. Oh, uh, beautiful. Ele elementals. He, he's got a lovely channel. He, he, he's uh, to see the blow. He, he's just, he's away with the fairies. Like, you know, he's just, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> but so, you know, whatever he's doing, he's genuine because he, he, he doesn't understand it all. He doesn't understand with the cameras. Now he's got a young lad with him and he helps him. But the the different beings that are on his channel, the little the little elves, the little pixies, the different ones, they're amazing. And, and and it's not CGI. I've looked at it and whatever. And I get a feeling when I see this, this is 100% real. And when you see these little people, and he does drawings of them. If anybody wants a drawing, he sells a drawing on his site. But you can have you can sit there and watch them. I'll, I'll give you the the home page, and you'll go through the whole lot. You'll see all the little videos. Pick a video what you want. His yeah. name's Ed. His name's Edwin, but he's yeah. absolutely brilliant. And you'll see some different ones. There's three of them together. There's little one standing there, and he's got a pouch on the back, 
and he's got all the little hazelnuts and he's thrown the hazelnuts down further for the other two to catch them. And Amazing them. stuff. And, it, and there was one part, he went out sitting with him and he lost his sandwich. He, he took his sandwich with him. He looked round and then he could see his sandwich just walking away into this little hole. They, they, <laughs> they nicked his sandwich and took it in there. It's amazing. Lovely. Well, I think this comes down to belief. I remember Paul was telling me the other day, Paul and Cyan were saying that when when he brings through ETs, those who believe in it can see them. Those that don't. Is that, that the story, Paul? That you need to have a, those that are blocked? No. No, no. no. We, we, we have, um, we do a lot of sittings with people. Um, we have, it, it doesn't, it's these days, it doesn't seem to matter whether you believe or not. That's what it's come down to. Mm -hmm. People see the ET stuff, they see the spirit people. And, you know, I think this is all to do with what's going on in the world at the moment. People, mm -hmm. people need, you know, to, to uh, feel that, you know, there is something more than what's going on. It's, it's very confronting, you know, what's going on at the moment with, globally. And I think that spirit people and ET and others are really trying hard to present themselves clearly to a lot of people so that, that they're, you know, a lot of people are suffering from mental unwellness and those sorts of things and it, depression and these sorts of things. And the more that mediums come out and present their proper evidence through spirit people and others, the, the better off the planet's going to be. Hopefully we are going through an awakening. Now, well, next... what, they told, what her spirit told us, Paul, was that um, the ones you're dealing with are not evolved. No matter what you do, they're not evolved and they just cannot take in what you tell them. Yeah, they well... just cannot understand it or take it in. Oh, well, yeah, I mean... for us, it's not, it's not really about convincing anybody of anything. We just do what we do and, if, and then we just continue on. Yeah. <clears throat> We're not I worried think that's, about... That's, that's the same any of us can do, is just do what we can do and share with people when it's appropriate because yeah. there are some people who, um, I mean, you know, lots and lots of our family, you, you'll sort of say... Gee, let me tell you about what happened last Saturday night. And I'll say, oh, that's interesting. What's on TV? You know, nobody's, you know, it's just too confronting for them. So there, there we go. 